Well, good morning, and everyone, and uh, welcome to our service again, as as, be, as you have been, and uh, I trust that the Lord will will meet with you uh, through the preaching of His Word this morning. Um, now, there is a popular saying that seeing is believing, and that is, of course, the attitude that you will only believe something if you have seen some evidence of it. Uh, now, there's a far less known saying, which is believing is seeing. And certainly in regards to spiritual matters, that is what the Bible calls us to live by. Jesus said to Martha in John 11, uh, before he raised her brother Lazarus from the, from, the, from the grave, said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And so this morning we will see both of these statements at play in our passage this morning in, in Matthew chapter 8. But scripture encourages us and, and exhorts us and commands us to live by faith. Uh, the definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so really it is weak faith that requires uh, some sort of visual proof or evidence. And a strong faith believes based on the hearing only. Uh, you may remember uh, doubting Thomas. Um, I feel always sorry for him having been given this uh, description because he really did not demand anything extra than what the disciples already received. They, of course, were uh, gathered in, in, in a room and Jesus suddenly appeared to them. That is the resurrected Jesus and they saw him and, and believed. And of course, Thomas was not with them. And then later on, when they shared with him uh, this encounter, he said, unless I see the, in his hands the imprints of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his sides, I will not believe. Uh, then Jesus appeared later and invited him to inspect the wounds of his crucifixion. And Thomas, of course, exclaimed, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see yet believed. And so really the, the biblical rendition of seeing is believing would probably be hearing is believing. I have not seen it yet, but I heard of it from the Lord, and therefore, based on His character, I believe what I have heard. Now, the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament scriptures, or the oracles of, of God, was entrusted or were entrusted to, to the Jewish people, uh, and this, the, the Word of God revealed to them that one day a servant would come to save them from their sin and to establish his kingdom uh, on earth. And we see a lot of that in Isaiah. The, the prophet Isaiah spoke about the coming servant, that this coming servant would be a sovereign king, an exalted sovereign king, that he would be just, uh, but also a compassionate uh, judge, that he will be the redeemer, uh, that would bring ba Jacob back to to God, uh, and that he would be also the suffering servant, uh, suffering for the sins of Israel, and that he would be the spirit-anointed servant, the one set apart by God to accomplish his deeds. And so his coming was to, were to be associated with the establishment of the kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven as, as Matthew records it for us. Uh, and this kingdom would be a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom of, of just uh, or uh, justice. And a part of this kingdom, Isaiah reveals to us, will, will, will come with great spiritual revival and physical restoration to the land, to the sky, to the people. Uh, you can read all of that. We've, we've covered an in-detail study of Isaiah, but Isaiah 11, Isaiah 60 to 66 gives us those, the picture of, of that. And then, of course, also part of that is that when the Messiah comes, he will remove sickness and disease from the people of God in the kingdom of God. And so these passages really informed the Jewish expectation of the Messiah. They were waiting for someone like that to be a king and come and rule uh, 
over them. Uh, this is what they heard, and this is what they believed in a sense. That is what they, they were hopeful for. Uh, but now Matthew comes to, the, him, or to them and to us uh, through his gospel and saying, See, this is him. This is, this is the Messiah. See and, and believe. And so Matthew presents to us Jesus as the Christ, Jesus as the Messiah. And, and we've seen last time that just through, he presents a number of reasons <clears throat> Presenting in chapter 1 the, the legal reasons, the genealogy that he was in the line of David. Uh, there were prophetic reasons, the fulfillment of prophecies surrounding his, his birth. There were divine reasons at his baptism that the Spirit of God through the, uh, d- uh, uh, descended upon him uh, in, the, in the manner of a, of a dove. And, and that God pronounced him to be his beloved son, well-pleasing to him. There were the spiritual reasons that he overcame temptation in the wilderness, something which the first Adam was unable to do. There were the theological reasons that he presents to us in chapters 5 to 7, where Jesus taught with authority the scriptures. And now in chapters 8 and 9, Matthew presents to us the supernatural reasons of why Christ is, or why Jesus is the Christ. And he was trying to urge and, 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 and exhort his compatriots to believe in Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the King. And so last week we saw Jesus healing the leper who came to him, the leper who believed in him, and he saw the kingdom really come in, in his life by being miraculously healed from an incurable disease, supernaturally healed, that is. Uh, And so this week, coming through our passage, Matthew 8, verses 5 to 70, we will see really two exhortations that, that this passage bring to us. And the first one is, believe and you will see. And the second one is, see so that you would Believe And these truths uh, is regarding faith in Jesus. And so believe and you will see. Believe in Jesus and you will see the kingdom come and, and see so that you would believe. See the works that he has done and believe that he is the king. And so let me read for us this passage. Just follow along in, in Matthew chapter 8 verse 5 to 17. Which reads as follows. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him imploring him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to the one, this one go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does this. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith in, with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from the east and west and will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness in that place where where, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. And when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in the bed with a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she got up and waited on him. Uh, When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help as we come to this word. Father, we we thank you, Lord, for the ministry of your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you that your spirit, the spirit of truth, Lord, it will minister to us, applying your word to our hearts. I pray, Lord, as we have asked that you have uh, cultivated, that you have tilled the 
the hearts of your people, Lord, to receive the life-giving word today. And pray, Father, as I preach, Lord, that I would preach faithfully and accurately your truth and that your truth is what will set your people free. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the first one, the first uh, exhortation that we have is believe and you will See, And so Jesus, after he preached on, on the mount, uh, the sermon on, on, on the mount near Capernaum, came down into this city, as we see, situated in the north uh, western shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was a garrison city where, where a number of Roman troops were stationed. And Luke 7, a parallel account to this encounter, uh, indicates that there were good relations between the Gentiles and the Jews in the city. Uh, and, of course, the Gospels reveal to us that Jesus did a lot of his ministry in Capernaum and surrounding areas, including miracles. And, and here we read that he was met by a centurion. Now, Luke 7 tells us that he was met by Jewish elders sent by the centurion. And so it may be worth for us maybe just to flip over to Luke 7. Just, let's just read that account as well um, of this Encounter that the centurion had with Jesus. Luke 7, verses 1 to 10, and uh, read as follow. And when he had completed his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum, and the centurion's slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. And when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. And they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and he has built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent some friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and another come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does that now when Jesus heard this he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him I say to you not even in Israel have I found such great faith uh, even those who had been sent returned to the house when they found the slave in good health and so we we, we sort of can try and reconcile these two passages the differences between these two passages may be understood first of all, by the emphasis of each of the writers. Luke was, was, was really emphasizing the sympathies of, of, of the centurion to the, to the Jewish people and also his humility uh, by saying that he can't even come to, 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 to present himself before Jesus. And Matthew had a focus on his faith and his ethnicity, that he was a Gentile. Uh, we can also reconcile these differences through the timing of the event. It may be that... Uh, the centurion sent the, the Jewish elders and then the friends and may even have appeared, although Luke doesn't record it. Matthew records this encounter that the centurion had with, with Jesus in person. Uh, or it can be reconciled to, if we understand that when you, in those days, when you sent a, a messenger or a representative of you, that really it is as if you are making the appeal yourself. Uh, and of course, we see an example of that with Jesus, who, to whom all authority has been given in heaven and earth, commands us, his disciples, to go and make disciples of all, all nations. And so when people receive our message uh, and receive uh, us as, as his messengers, then they are saved. And when they reject his message and reject his messengers, then it is as if they are rejecting Christ himself. Uh, you, you remember when, when Paul or Saul at that time, when he encountered Jesus on the road of Damascus, uh, when, while he was persecuting the church, Jesus asked him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, so so uh, representatives in those days were, were, were personal, uh, is, is, is as if they represent the, per, the person in, in person. Uh, now, the centurion, the centurion was a military 
commander. Uh, he was a military officer uh, and had command over about a hundred people. It was a, it was a middle rank. There were about four ranks above him to get to general or commander and about five or so more maybe more ranks below him. And, and the centurion really attained his rank through just faithful service, through experience, through, through knowledge. Um, and we read of, of six different centurions in the New Testament. Uh, all of them were men of character, were men of integrity. They had a sense of duty and justice. And we read, of course, in our passage about this centurion, he had great care and compassion for his slave and therefore uh, approached Jesus to heal him. Uh, we read of the centurion overseeing the execution of Jesus uh, at his crucifixion, concluded as he saw Jesus die that surely this was an innocent man. Surely this was the Son of God. Uh, then we, uh, we read of uh, the centurion Cornelius to whom Peter preached the, the gospel. He was a God-fearing ma man, a, a caring and generous man, a benevolent man uh, who believed the gospel when Peter uh, presented it to him. Uh, in Acts, later on in Acts, we read of a centurion who really rescued uh, Paul from being scourged after he was arrested. Uh, the Jews were in uproar of what he was saying, and they were about to scourge him to, to find out the reason for this. Uh, and when he uh, declared to the centurion that he was a Roman citizen, the centurion went to his commander and basically his scourging was stopped. Uh, two other centurions were given the responsibility to transfer uh, Paul from, Caesarea, uh, from, from Jerusalem to Caesarea after a plot to murder him was discovered in Acts 23. And then finally we read of Centurion Julius who es escorted Paul from uh, Caesarea to Rome uh, after he appealed to Caesar. And Julius kept his men from killing uh, Paul when they shipwrecked on the island of Malta in, in Acts 27. So, so really the Centurion was, were, were men that was that were that were greatly respected. They they were respected because they they served with the the the, the men in battle. Uh, they were the, it's probably usually the the highest rank that a, that an ordinary soldier could attain to was that of a centurion, uh, and they were quite well paid as well as 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 a career soldier. Uh, and really, this this soldier, this centurion's faith was incredible. I mean, it was commended by Jesus. Uh, he was he he was a humble man, and he understood authority. Um, and he heard of Jesus, he believed, and then, of course, he acted. Um, and so his faith is, is to be imitated, I believe. We, we can learn from the centurion about, about believing. And we see, first of all, that, that his faith uh, was a faith that, that acted, uh, that, that responded to situations. He believed in Jesus uh, he believed not because of what he's seen, because we read in Luke 7, 3, that he heard of Jesus. Uh, and now he approached him, and this approaching of the centurion again should grab our attention because there was much that would have prevented this man from coming to Jesus. Remember, he was a centurion. He had some status. He was a prominent man in Capernaum. And Jesus was really um, a Jew and, and, uh, and a carpenter. And, of course, uh, being a centurion in the Roman army, it was an occupying force. And so he had really the authority to summon Jesus to him, but he didn't. He came to him. Uh, by delegation and in person. Um, he was, of course, a soldier, a man of violence, a man of war, and Jesus was a man of peace, coming to make peace between God and man. And uh, furthermore, the centurion was a Roman. He was a Gentile, um, unclean. Um, and Jesus, of course, was a Jew descendant from Abraham. So in spite of all these obstacles, these things that one would think would prevent him from coming in this way, he believed and acted. He acted by coming, by coming to Jesus, by approaching him. He had a, he had a great concern. Uh, he had an obligation to care for, for his slave, and he needed help because this was beyond his ability. This was, this was something that he could not 
deal with and he needed help. He heard and he believed and so he was assured of the things hoped for and convicted of the things not seen and therefore he came and approached Jesus. And that is what we should do. We who claim faith in Christ or even if you don't have faith in Christ, um, you may have a pressing need today. You may have a great concern. You may be anxious about things. You may have a physical concern or a spiritual one. And truly, there is no greater spiritual concern than to know that you are right with God, that you are at peace with God, that your sins have been forgiven by God. And so you may be here today really tormented plagued by the sins of your past, perhaps even the sins of your present. Your conscience is killing you. Your guilt is condemning you. And you are afraid. What is, other, what is others going to say? I'm ashamed of what I have, have done. And, and so you may be reluctant to come. All the while, Jesus stands with an invitation, come, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn from you, from me, because I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And yet, like the centurion, there may be many things that you feel keep you from coming prevent you from approaching Jesus. I mean, your sinful past. I mean, I'm, I'm not really a church person. I, I don't really have enough knowledge. I'm, I'm not a righteous man or a woman. How can I come to Jesus? Maybe I should first try and make myself a little bit more presentable to him. My friend, if you come as you are, sinful as you are and you come confessing that you are a sinner and you come believing that he is able to forgive you your sins based on what he has done he will make you presentable to God he will receive you he will cleanse you of your sins and he will give you his righteousness as we've heard earlier in the gospel presentation and so believe and see. Believe and receive His love, His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness, His Holy Spirit. New life in Him. Come, come. Or perhaps you are in right standing with the Lord, but you are weighed down by a spiritual or physical care or concern. And you feel that you can't come because... Man, I, I, sh I should be past it. I shouldn't be struggling with, with this kind of thing. Um, and uh, I should not have done this. What is others going to say? What is others going to think? And to you, the word of the Lord is, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in the proper time. Casting all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. And so the first act of faith is to come. To come to Jesus, to turn to Jesus, to look to Jesus, to come to him as the centurion did. He, he heard and he believed and he acted. And he not only acted, he not only came, he came and he asked. He, his faith, he had faith enough to ask, to make a request, to make a, a petition. He implored, Jesus, verse 5 said. That means he entreated him, he besieged him, he appealed to Jesus to help him. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Luke uses the word doulos, which means slave. Uh, Matthew used the word pays, which means a, a little boy. So it could be that it was a servant boy, a slave boy that, that he had and, and that the centurion greatly valued, may even love the little boy as a father would love a son. And Luke 7, 2 tells us that this servant boy was, was near death.
Now one can understand that this centurion having uh, enough faith not only to come, but, but, he, he, but to come asking, to come praying, to come petitioning, interceding for the life of his slave boy. His faith was a faith that prayed, that asked. Lord, I believe you. Lord, I believe you. Now please help my servant boy. I heard, I believe, I came. And now I'm imploring you, Lord. Help my slave boy. And so how strong is your faith? How strong is my faith? Is it strong enough to pray? And you say, Franz, that's a ridiculous question. Of course, how can someone who is a Christian not pray? I agree with you. And yet, many of us don't pray. We don't ask. We first try to exhaust all other options. Try everything in our power and our might. And then finally... As the last resort, we would pray. Is that a strong faith? Or is that evidence of a weak faith? The centurion came and he interceded for his slave boy. He was asking not for himself, but mercy on his slave boy. He came to Jesus and he prayed. He implored him on behalf of another. And of course, the scriptures exhort us as believers to pray, to pray, to pray without ceasing, to be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to him. We are petitioned to pray with all prayer and petition at all times in the Spirit, with all perseverance for all the saints. We are called to bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Paul modeled this for us when, when in many of his letters we have his prayers recorded for us that he prayed for the churches he planted and even those he didn't he prayed in Colossians we read of of the church in Laodicea that he did not visit it ever and yet we read that he uh, labored and he strived strove for for these churches struggling for them really the word striving and, and struggling is agonizumai it's agony he labored for them in prayer and that's the only way he could labor for them in prayer was because he never visited them he never met with them And then he wrote in Romans 12 that we should be devoted to one another and be devoted to prayer. And so I don't think it is, well, I think it's a ridiculous question, but sadly, many of us don't pray. Pray for yourself. You may pray for yourself. Pray for others, for their needs. Pray for this body of believers. There are many influences that seeks to tear this body of believers apart. Pray. Ask our Lord for that not to happen. Pray against that. And so he had a faith that acted. He had a faith that asked. And he had a faith that acknowledged the authority of Christ, really the lordship of Christ. Jesus answered him and said, I will come and heal him. Now he heard these words of Jesus and he believed. He believed the word of the Lord. In fact, he accepted the reality of his slave boy's healing the moment Jesus spoke those words. He believed Jesus. He believed the word of God. 
He believed Jesus had the authority to command that affliction in his servant to go and it must go because he had authority over disease. He's God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. And he acknowledged that Jesus had authority higher than his own. I th think and I believe that he acknowledged Jesus' authority over him, a Gentile centurion. I think he believed that Jesus was in fact the Christ, the King of the Jews. Why do I say that? Well, he came humbly. He came humbly. He was a man of stature, a man of rank, a man of prominence in, his, in that city, and, and yet he came humbly, considering himself unworthy. Lord, I am not worthy for you, for, for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. He called him Lord. Now, of course, in the Greek, there's not a distinction whether that is the word is the same word that we use for sir and master as for the Lord, as in the Lord God. And I think he could have said that as in sir, come and help me. But then he asked him that no sir can do for him except God himself. So I believe that he, when he addressed him as Lord, he addressed him as Christ. And he, as I said, he considered himself unworthy. Unworthy to come to him, Luke tells us, unworthy to receive him into his own home. Of course, being a centurion in Israel and the good relationship that he had with the Jewish elders and the synagogue that he built, he would understand that uh, if, if Jesus were to come into his home, that the law would render Jesus defiled. And so maybe he was sensitive to the law. Uh, but I think more likely that, as I said, he became to believe that Jesus is the Messiah because no one did what Jesus could do. And so he came not based on his status, not based on his merit, not based on his good works, but depending purely on the good grace of the Lord. He came and he asked, recognized Jesus' authority, Jesus' lordship. And of course, we read in Luke 7, 3 that uh, the request was first made through these inter, uh, intermediaries, his representation that was of Jewish elders. And it's, it's interesting, ironically, what do they do? They plead with Jesus based on the centurion's merit. He's, he's a good man. He's, he's, he's good to our nation. He's built our synagogue. Uh, but not this centurion himself. He acknowledged that he is not worthy to come and that Jesus had authority far higher than his own. And he understood authority. He said, I'm a man under authority with, uh, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, goes and he goes and another come and he comes into my slave, do this and he does it. He acknowledges Jesus' authority over disease. And he, he, he realized that when Jesus gives the command, he be healed, that illness had to flee, had to go. Like, uh, like a, a subservient in his, among his men, a soldier within his company. And so he acknowledged, he accepted, he recognized, he submitted to the authority of Jesus. Uh, command, Lord, and your will will be done. That, that is incredibly great faith. He was assured of the things hoped for, convicted of the things not seen, based on the word of Christ. And that's what, that's what we are called to live by, the words of Christ. And first of all, we must realize when we come to the Lord, we don't come with any merit of our own. We come purely based on the merit of Christ now in our day. We can't be like the Pharisee who, in Luke 18 who prayed and said, Lord, I'm so thankful I'm not like this tax collector over here. I do good works. I tithe. I do all these religious activities. And yet the tax collector was standing aside, beating his breast, saying, have mercy on me, Lord. 
a sinner. We can come only based on the merits of Christ and not our own. And so to have great faith, great faith that will act, great faith that will ask, great faith that acknowledge the authority of God, that faith produces humility in us. We can come to the Lord freely because of Christ, not because of anything in and of ourselves. And it's also a submissive faith. We obey the word of the Lord because it is His word. He has the authority, the authority over us. And the centurion, he heard and believed. He believed and he came. He came and he asked. He asked and accepted the word of God because he acknowledged the authority of Jesus. And that is the kind of faith that will admit you into the kingdom of God. Um, Verse 10, we read Jesus' response to to the centurion's faith. Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Jesus commended such faith. Now the people of Israel, they were redeemed out of Egypt. God made them his own He entered into a covenant with them, the Mosaic covenant. He gave them his laws, his ordinances, his oracles. It was to him that he sends the prophets who would reveal his his future plans and purposes, his coming a king, the servant. And they heard and they saw, and yet many did not believe. But this Gentile, separated from God, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, the spiritual heritage of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, he heard and he believed. He believed and he acted. He believed and he asked. He believed and accepted the word of God because of the authority of Christ. And so the kingdom, really here we read that... that, uh, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into uh, the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so, of course, the kingdom was given to, uh, was, 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 was promised to Israel. First of all, through Abraham. Abraham was called by God and promises were made to him, promises of a land, promises of a, of a great nation that will come from, from his seed, a great a seed that will ultimately bless all families of the earth. And he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And of course, Isaac, his son, he was the son of the promise. He was the son of the blessing, the first fruit. And so he received that blessing, that promise. And of course, from him came Jacob, the second born of of Isaac. uh, And he received the blessing of Abraham, the promises given to Abraham. Uh, And when Isaac sent him away, uh, he met with God in a dream at Beersheba. And there God reaffirmed to him that the promises he gave to Abraham was now his. And later on, he, when he was uh, preparing to encounter his brother Esau, he wrestled all night with an angel of the Lord um, and he prevailed. And so his name was changed from Jacob to I, Israel. And Israel, of course, his 12 sons became the tribes of, of the nation Israel. And it was the nation Israel that God had made his covenant with the stipulations which we have uh, in the law mediated through Moses. And it was to the nation Israel that the promises, the prophecies came about the coming servant, that the king who would be a savior, the king who would be the spirit anointed one, the king who would be king supreme. The The little stone that came from Daniel's vision and destroyed all the kingdoms that was before and was, was established on, over all the earth. They were the people of the kingdom. And yet, we read here that many from the east and the west 
will come and dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Why? They heard and they believed. They believed and they will see. And yet, sadly, many of the sons of the kingdom, many descendants from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they heard. And when Jesus came, they saw, and yet they did not believe. And they would be excluded from the kingdom of heaven. Because faith is required as the entrance to the kingdom. And those who do not come through faith in Jesus Christ, they would be cast into the place of torment where there is utter darkness. And the only thing that you will notice is the piercing sounds of wailing and weeping and the gnashing of teeth. A horrible place of torment. Why? Because they heard, they saw, and they did not believe. They hardened their hearts against the Lord. And the promise to us today is believe and you will see. You will see the kingdom of heaven. And the second point of this morning's sermon is see so that you will believe. Verse 14 of Matthew 8, when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in the bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and waited on him. When evening came, they brought him many who were demon-possessed and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. You see, Jesus had the authority over this disease. And we saw him respond with compassion to the leper, to the faith of the leper who came to him. And, and we see now him responding with marvel at the faith of the centurion. They believed, and so they were privileged to see to get a little glimpse of the kingdom of heaven in their own lives at that time. A glimpse of the consummated kingdom, of what the consummated kingdom would be like. Now verse 14 to 17, we read here of, of a deeds that Jesus did so that others would believe, that they would see and believe that he is the king, that they would see and so they would believe. He performed works that the prophets foretold the coming Christ would perform. He preached the good news to the poor. He proclaimed the release to the captives. He was the recovery of sight to the blind. He was setting free the oppressed. He proclaimed the favorable year of the Lord. Luke 4, 18 and following. And then we read that he was sent of God and that God was the one who attested him to be of God or from God and that his message is God's message. In John 10 verse 25 we read, Jesus answered, I, this is after the Jews ask him, tell us plainly if you are the Christ. After they've seen all these things, Jesus answered, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. And a few verses later, verse 37, if, you do not, uh, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. As a claim to deity, believe that I am God. But instead of believing, they sought to kill him. Now here in our passage in verse 15, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law without being asked, 
with other requests being made, with no mention of her faith. We don't know if she believed in Jesus. She may have, but having heard from Peter, her son-in-law, we don't know if she had saving faith. But Jesus healed her without being asked to, simply because it served the purposes of the kingdom, the purposes of God. He touched her hand, and by his supernatural authority over disease, the fever fled from her body. She was healed. She was restored. And her first impulse, her first action response was to get up and serve the king. She waited on Jesus. She got up and waited on them and served them. God's purpose for her unsolicited healing was to provide physical sustenance to Jesus so that he could perform his spiritual mission, which in this context was to do miracles that, that affirms his deity, that he is who he claimed to be. And so through her ministry, Jesus was physically refreshed and sustained to minister to others. And we read at verse 16 that many came. Many came who were demon-possessed. And he cast them out with a word. And many came with diseased. And what does he say? He healed them all. No indication of their faith in him. He did it so that they would see and believe that he is the king of the kingdom. That the kingdom is at hand. And we read that this was done to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah had said. Seeing is believing and believing is seeing. They heard the word. Now they see the works. Some believed, yet most did not. Many saw his power, his authority, and yet we read that many, in the end, did not receive him as their king, as their savior. Isaiah, that Matthew quotes, Matthew, sorry, Isaiah 53, 4, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Grief really is the word for sickness and affirmities and sorrows is the word for pain, affliction or disease. And Matthew was quoting Isaiah and was teaching and pointing to this truth that Jesus in doing what he was doing in healing these people was carrying away their disease and their suffering. I mean, uh, it would be true to say that when in Jesus' ministry, he healed so many people at that time that he all but banished sickness and disease from, from Canaan at that time during his earthly ministry. He delivered them. He healed them. All who would believe and come will see and experience the power of the king and his authority over disease. And those who did not believe was invited to see so that they would believe. Now there's some erroneous teaching that has come from, from this passage and how uh, Matthew quotes Isaiah. And some teach that, that God wants his people to be healthy. And that if you are a Christian believer, then you should be healthy because uh, the Lord would heal you. Uh, you are part of his kingdom. And so when you seek, you need to pray. And then Jesus would heal you, heal you even supernaturally. And if that does not happen, then you are lacking faith. You don't have enough faith. And that has caused so much heartache and pain in the people of God who was already suffering from their physical afflictions. Now they were also suffering of the spiritual one, being told they don't have enough faith. And therefore the Lord has closed his heart to them. But as always with these 
false erroneous teachings, there, there is an element of truth in that. That we know that Jesus came and on the cross he he paid the penalty for sin and also broke the power of sin over us. Uh, but he has yet to remove the presence of sin among us. Uh, we are, we, if you are saved, you are transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. If you are saved, you have ex expressed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, then you are in the kingdom. And yet we sin. Why? Well, it's because we live in this time frame of the now but not yet. The, we are, Jesus came at his first coming and instituted the, the kingdom, but yet it's to be co consummated at his second coming. And at his second coming, he will remove sin from us. He will remove the presence of sin from us. Until then, we have been forgiven because the penalty has been paid. Sin does not have the power over us. We have the ability to say no now, where previously we were blind, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. Now you can say no. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are a slave to righteousness, Romans 6 tells us. And the same is true of healing. Uh, healing... When Jesus came, he took away all their sins and their, oh, sorry, their, their diseases and infirmities and their sorrows. And, and on the cross, in paying for our sin, really, Jesus provided healing for his people. And yet we get sick. Why? Well, we live in this time, the now and not yet era of the kingdom, where We've been initiated into the kingdom, but the full blessings of the kingdom will come at its consummation when the Lord returns. And so the question is, does Jesus still heal supernaturally today, miraculously today? Absolutely. He is able. He can, and I believe he does. But he does so to fulfill his plans and purposes to advance his kingdom. Just as, as Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law to advance the purposes of his kingdom. And so throughout, it's interesting, throughout biblical history, uh, when faith was at its weakest, that's when the Lord condescends and helped his people to believe through miracles, through healings, through, through all kinds of signs. And of course, we read of that when, when, when Israel was enslaved in Egypt. And so what does God do? He came and rescued them, delivered them from Egypt with a mighty hand through amazing miracles, sustaining them through miraculously in the desert for 40 years so that they would see and believe that he is God and that he can deliver them. And then he provided for them his law. says, live by this so that you would be a people set apart for me. And of course, later on, many years later on, uh, there was a time of great apostasy. Uh, when there were only 7,000 in all of Israel who did not indulge in idolatry, who did not bow the knee to Baal. And so the Lord sent Elijah and Elisha again who did miraculous things. Why? Believe that he is God. Believe that these two men, these two prophets spoke for me. And so people would see so that they would believe and then when Jesus came and he, he instituted the new covenant and to say that he is the Christ, the king. And so many miracles was done through Jesus and then through his apostles as he was sent the message. These are men of God who speaks God's message. Believe. See so that you would believe. And of course, that was in the time before the word of God was completed. The self-authenticating word of God. That was at a time when new revelation was given. And so miraculous signs were given to affirm the message and the messenger. 
We now live in a time when the Bible has been given to us complete. This is the full canon of Scripture that God has given us, His people. And now, because it's self-authenticating, when we read of the miracles of Jesus, it is expected that you would believe it as if you have seen it. That is what is expected of us. We need to believe so that we would see. And at times, by God's grace, sometimes He still intervenes miraculously. And so people would see so that they would believe. And so we learn from, from uh, Peter's mother-in-law that she, she experienced, she saw the kingdom of God by being healed instantly. And what did she do immediately? She served the Lord to advance his purposes, the kingdom purposes. And scripture tells us there are two categories of gifts in First Peter 4, verse 10 and 11. Uh, each has received a special gift employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, speaks as if he speaks the utterances of God. Whoever serves, do so as the one who serves with the strength that God supply. And so there's two kinds of gifts. There's speaking gifts and there's serving gifts. Regardless of, both are equally necessary to advance the kingdom of God. And so if you have been saved, if you have been touched, if you have experienced new life in Christ, experienced the kingdom of God has come in your heart, then get up and serve the purposes of the Lord. Bear fruit for His name. And people, the fruit is not for us. It's not for us to marvel and say, man, look at these things growing on me. They are for the glory of God and for the benefit of others. Let your fruit give life to someone else. But sadly, many in that city in Capernaum saw the deeds that Jesus did, the deeds of the kingdom, the deeds that will accompany the consummation of the kingdom, and yet they did not believe. In Matthew 11, verse 20 and following, we read, Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles was done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable in the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. See so that you would believe. When you hear the Word of God, when you read the Word of God, and you ignore the Word of God, you are putting yourself under judgment. Or that is if you're outside of the kingdom, if you're in the kingdom, under chastisement. Jesus had authority over disease. And from this passage, we are exhorted, first of all, by the centurion to believe so that we will see the kingdom of heaven. And we are exhorted by Peter's mother-in-law when we are touched by the Lord, when we are healed, when we are saved, that we would get up and work so that others would see 
so that they would believe. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us, Lord, your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself in the scriptures. Lord, and you call us to believe your word and so that we would act upon it, that we would obey it, but that we would submit to your authority, that we would trust it, and that we would tell others of it, Lord, so that your kingdom would be advanced. And so, Lord, help us to believe so that we will see. And, Lord, as we work in your vineyard, help us to do so so that others would see and that they would believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our God. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.